Okay, um, well I'd like to start by thanking Reza for the introduction and also the invitation to speak here today. Um, and thank you to IAI for the sponsorship of this uh, series. Um, I didn't know I was supposed to give a broad overview presentation, but fortunately um, okay. um, this talk does have uh, what I hope to uh, be some tutorial value for one of the projects and one of the activities going on in my research lab. Um, but also, I, before I get started, I just wanted to acknowledge um, all the friendly and familiar faces of colleagues and students I see here from Aerospace and from ISR, so it's great to see everybody here. So thanks for coming. Hey, Eric. Even colleagues from NRL. We should have lunch sometime. Um, so I'll be talking about flow sensing and control for an underwater vehicle platform. Um, and this is a, this, I, I chose this topic to speak about today because I think it may be one of the only topics you haven't heard me talk about already. I gave a, a seminar in the, in the electrical engineering seminar series last year on some of our other work in, in mobile sensor networks. And Andre's heard, heard me talk about mosquitoes and fish before at CDC. And so I thought, well, this is a relatively new topic. We're, we're, in, we're just finishing up our second year of this effort, supported by ONR. So, but we're getting some really delightful results, um, largely through um, a, a collaboration with my co-investigators and our really excellent group of students, um, several of whom are here today. So I just want to start by acknowledging Frank and Levi, uh, my students here. Uh, you guys want to just raise your hand so I can embarrass you? So nearly all of the slides you're going to see today came from Frank and Levi uh, um, and, and, and their really hard work over the last couple of years. So I want to make sure that they get the proper acknowledgement. I also want to acknowledge the fact that this is a multi-investigator project. And so we're working closely with Sean Humbert, um, as, you, as you know, um, here in the Autonomous Vehicle Laboratory and his outstanding student, Badri. Um, and our collaborators from other institutions as well, Xiaobo Tan of Michigan State and his student Hong, who we were fortunate enough to host last summer for two weeks doing a lot of work for this project here, um, and Cheryl Coombs um, and her student Joe at Bowling Green. And I want to just highlight not only the, the, the sponsorship uh, of this program th um, through the Bio-Inspired Autonomous Systems Program at ONR, but also the fact that this is a multidisciplinary effort. Um, and we, we have a number of fields represented, ranging from controls and robotics to material science um, as, and biology. Cheryl Coombs is one of the leading experts on, on uh, flow sensing and hearing in fish and aquatic organisms. I also forgot to mention Chabot is a graduate of ISR. Uh, many, many of you may know that. Um, and so it's been a real pleasure to work with him and uh, his research program at MSU is, is really fantastic. Um, so this project um, has the following goal, uh, which you can read there, but the focus is on emulating hydrodynamic uh, sensing behavior in fish, not so much focusing on propulsion as other folks have done and we hope to do in the future, but rather looking at how we can take biosensing, which is distributed in nature, and perform closed loop control in a rigorous way. So specifically, we're applying tools from a range of, of uh, research disciplines, uh, including neuroethology, information theory, control theory, material science, to really study the problem of spatial and submodal integration of flow information for feedback control in the underwater environment. And so we'll talk about the different sensing modalities that fish use and how we've engineered um, artificial um, uh, prototypes to, to replicate that. So a little bit about the division of labor, and I'll give a highlight of each of the investigators' contribution to the project, and then I'll get into the, my, my portion in detail. But, uh, but again, this is a multidisciplinary effort, um, so it's been really exciting to work with people um, and, and to study these problems at the interface of, of these disciplines, because as many of you in ISR know, that can be incredibly rewarding because of, of how much there is to, to, to learn and to contribute to the state of the art. Um, so in particular, um, Cheryl's the biologist on the program and her, her contribution has largely been to study um, animal behavior in the laboratory. So she conducts experiments on, on reattactic behavior in fish, which is their tendency to orient upstream in a flow. And to do this, she's looked at, uh, she's immersed the fish in flowing water tanks under various sensory conditions in order to study this, this behavior. Um, Sean and I have focused on the control aspects. Sean has had a great deal of success in emulating um, methods from insect vision 
in which uh, spatial integration over sensor arrays is used to perform sensory motor uh, control of autonomous platforms. And it, this paradigm has translated seamlessly to the underwater environment with an entirely different sensing modality. And so that's a real testament to the robustness of this, of this paradigm. Um, and Xiaobo Tan at Michigan has really been looking at the fabrication of the individual sensing units. How can we build um, um, soft, flexible sensory um, systems that resemble the biology and the anatomy of the fish in order to extract some of the same information from the fluid environment as fish do? And lastly, and the focus of today's talk will be the robotic system that we've developed uh, under very constrained uh, motion. So we've limited the degrees of freedom of our robotic fish uh, substantially in order to highlight the closed-loop control using the flow information. Okay? So the real hope here um, and, the, and the overall mission of the ONR program that sponsors this is to create novel uh, platforms for, for naval missions that use closed-loop control with biosensing. So everything I've learned about the lateral line system has uh, come from Cheryl, and so I'll do my best here to explain it to you. Um, there, there are two modalities, as I mentioned, to the f uh, lateral line system, which is the fish sensing, um, uh, flow sensing system. Um, and these modalities are referred to as superficial neural mass and canal neural mass. Um, superficial neural mass encode velocity information. They're composed of these, of, these, um, of these sensors that extrude from the surface of the fish in such a way is to be deflected by the oncoming flow. Okay? And in this, these series of, of images here, where the, uh, the uh, superficial and canal neural mass are highlighted in the species of giant danio and zebrafish, indicate these very complex geometries that the sensor arrays on the fish uh, um, appear in. This is the snout of the fish. This is a top view with the eyes of the fish. And you can see the patterns of these sensory neural mass um, over the snout of the fish. It's not just on the side of the fish, as the lateral line system is sort of informally um, known as the stripe that you see on the side of the fish. While that is true, um, we also see um, sensors distributed over the head and, and snout. Um, the canal neural mass, on the other hand, um, they, they use the same basic um, um, hair sensory system as the superficial neural mass, but they encode pressure difference in information in the following way. They're actually, as the name suggests, um, they actually appear underneath the surface of the skin of the fish in a canal that's exposed to the, out, the, to the fluid environment through pores. And so the, the flow of water in, of fluid in the canal is determined by the pressure difference between the inlet and outlet pores of the canal. And so the deflection of the, of the hair si system that produces the sensory signal is proportional to that pressure difference. Okay, so that's the second sensory modality in the fish. And you can see some of the canal neural mass highlighted uh, uh, here on, on the fish body. Okay, and so while we started with the, with the superficial neural mass, ultimately we uh, grew to appreciate and, and again intend to replicate the functionality of the canal neural mass as well. The, the canal neural mass measure the pressure difference, um, and it's a little hard to see from this figure, but there, there are external openings to the fluid environment um, in which fluid it can, it passes. And the difference in pressure between the inlet and, and outlet of, that, of the uh, canal system uh, determines the direction of the flow in the canal, and that's the signal that the neuromass is measuring. The neuromass actually resides inside the canal. The two measurements are perfect, right? perfect. Indeed, they are. Yes, and we'll talk about Bernoulli's principle when we get right. to it. That's that's a, In fact, it's one. It's the connection between the measurements of what we're trying to leverage, and and trying to understand why do fish have both of these submodalities of the lateral line system. That's a good point. So Cheryl's work, as I said, has been largely experimental. One of the things that she's observed is that the the canal neural mass uh, and the, sorry the, the lateral line system um, has a different role in the behavior of these different species. So the performance of the lateral line system and indeed its contribution to the reataxis behavior, which is the tendency of fish to orient upstream, depends on the species. So she's developed a quantitative index 
um, in which you can actually report as a function of flow speed the performance of these different species in their uh, proclivity to orient upstream. And this is done by immersing the fish in a flow tank and then filming the fish with video cameras, extracting the position and orientation of the fish over time and quantifying the data in that way. Um, in, in addition to that, Cheryl has a technique for depriving the fish of their lateral line system th by immersing them in an antibiotic that temporarily kills off the, the hair cells that compose the sensory system of the lateral line. And in doing so, can actually determine um, the effect and, and therefore in, uh, conclude, make conclusions about the role of the lateral line in the reattactic behavior. And so for certain species, we see very little effect, in some cases a negative effect of the deprivation. Um, but if for some um, species like this Cory catfish um, that actually uh, rests on the substrate, the bottom of the tank, we see an extraordinary difference um, when between the reattacted performance of the fish with the lateral line system and without the lateral line system, indicating that it has a strong role in this behavior. Yeah, Bill. The antibiotic just blocks the yeah. lateral line, not the masts. The the, the 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 effect of the of the antibiotic is somewhat disputed in the literature, but um, but there. The, the way that it's applied to the fish is believed to inhibit the, the, both the canal and the superficial neural mass. Um, there are other sensing modalities in the fish besides vision, for example, um, besides the lateral, lateral line, including their vestibular system or the inner ear system that is not believed to be affected by, the, by this treatment. The inner ear system is like ours. It gives you acceleration. That's right. Yeah, like an inertial system. Same Moving on to Xiaobo's work, uh, before we get to the work that, that we're doing on the project, this is really in the material science aspect of the project and how to fabricate <coughs> these flexible structures that can encode information about the fluid flow. And so uh, Xiaobo has pioneered this approach using uh, millimeter scale ionic polymer metal composite sensors that when, def when bent uh, produce an electrical signal. In this case, that's that shows this really strong correlation with the, with the uh, flow velocity. And in fact, it's the geometry and the arrays of these sensors that we hope to um, uh, create uh, to resemble those that are, um, reside on the fish. Sean's work, as I mentioned, it really comes from a, 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 a sensory motor um, a paradigm that emulates what insects do in their perception of optical flow. And it's, a, it's, uh, it's technically uh, known as a static output feedback control design. So we have our, our standard clockwise control loop here with a plant maybe in a slightly different configuration than we normally see. But the point is that as, as in this case, flow um, passes over the, the body of, of our fish robot, um, we can use low frequency basis functions to extract the contribution of those uh, frequencies to the overall signal and then invert um, the, these coefficients uh, by an appropriate choice of gains to produce estimates of the states of the robot. And, and in fact, in this case, the states correspond to, correspond to the position orientation of a planar robot. Yeah, Bill. Well, I'm sorry, but I don't understand the kinematics here. Uh, uh, what is the causality? Do you have a control signal that, that instantly changes the kinematics? Or yeah, in this case, it would be like a planar robot under kinematic control, so that the, the control signal might be modeled as the velocity of the robot, both translational and rotational. So in this case, the u theta denotes the rotational control. So for example, if you were to parametrize the orientation of this robot with respect to an inertial frame by the parameter, by the state variable theta, then the kinematics might be theta dot equals u sub theta, for example. But that's dynamics. It's just a sort of um, you know, reduced dynamics. It's not really kinematics. OK. Well, I think what he was getting at with this chart was the distinction that the, the angular dynamics were first order. If I if I had to guess, so that the dynamic version of that would be would involve changes to the angular momentum, rather than the angular velocity. Yeah, yeah, but you're ignoring acceleration. Exactly. Reduction. Yeah, yeah. But, but you have a three-dimensional body. 
that's some very intricate motion in the state, which in the species you described can vary from just flowing past or staying and depending on some sort Yeah, of and which is very complicated. That's a really important point, and that's Our why what that's why, well, it's not, and that's why what you'll see in the entire presentation, in fact, is our efforts to restrict the system to two dimensions. Space and time are both critically important, but the spatial dimensions are restricted to two. Okay, so then the, the final uh, introductory slide here is, um, describes the, the overall uh, system that, that we're, we're putting together in this project that involves all aspects of the controls, the material science, and the biology. And, and the, uh, the outcome is a prototype robotic system that implements this dynamic feedback for reataxis and station holding. And this is the tendency to orient upstream, and this is the tendency of fish to actually translate into the wake of a fixed obstacle. And so both of these fish-inspired behaviors are desired uh, outcomes of our closed-loop control system. And this is a, 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 an image of the prototype fish. Um, what you'll see, it actually has an airfoil shape that's been extruded in that third dimension to reduce um, the three-dimensional effects that John was referring to. And in fact, the motor control system here is kinematic in nature, as Bill pointed out. And we, we're not working with the dynamics um, because of the constraints of the gantry system. So we'll talk more about this, but um, I want to tell you a little bit about the outline of the talk. Um, and so the first uh, part of the talk here um, really is, a, is an attempt to to broaden kind of the, the the audience understanding for those not in the controls field specifically, and so uh, we'll we'll have I'm sure some really spirited discussion um, there, um, and then we'll talk about the application of this control uh, to our uh, to uh, enable these two fish inspired motions of reataxis and station holding, and then lastly we'll get back to the point regarding these two different modalities, the pressure sensing and the velocity sensing, and how we can uh, synthesize them in our system. Okay, so wh what do we mean when we talk about dynamic output feedback? And so this is your introductory undergraduate level control systems diagram that's probably intimately familiar to many of you but not familiar to some of you. Um, and um, just to highlight this sort of clockwise uh, uh, rotation that we see here where uh, we, ha we, we, we put a minus sign here to indicate that we're using negative feedback and the difference between the reference and the state of the plant is the input to the control system. And the control system uses that to determine the input to the plant. If you prefer a more mathematical description, then this is a state space form where our, our state x is, has, has dynamics determined by some possibly nonlinear function of the state and the control input u. Okay? And in particular, when we prescribe the control input to be a function of the state, then that's what we refer to as state feedback. And this is sort of the ideal for a control system. If you have a state accessible to you, then you can do full state feedback. And generally speaking, life is good. Okay? But this is not the case for us. What's the case for us is that the state is actually being measured by these sensors, okay? And what we have available to us in our, in our control system is not the state, but actually the output of the sensor system. So mathematically, we describe this by the second equation here, y. And so what that means is that, unlike on the previous slide, we can't use the state in the definition of the control. We can only use the output. So the challenge here um, is how to use the output of, of the system described by this possibly nonlinear function h in order to, de to determine the control u. And so this is what we mean when we say output feedback. So we're getting a little bit closer here. So lastly, um, one method to, to, to address this control design question, it, w that is when we have this, the output of a sensor rather than the state accessible to us, is to introduce an observer. And an observer takes the output and produces the state estimate. Remember, what we really want in our control is to have access to the state so we can compare it to the reference signal in order to produce the control input. Um, but if we don't have the state, then the next best thing is an estimate of the state. Okay, and so mathematically, we denote that by this, this term here, x hat. So it's, it's almost as good as the state, as long as our observer minimizes the error between the estimate, estimated state x hat and the state itself. Okay, so this is where we get to the dynamic feedback. We get to choose x hat. 
okay? What this, how we produce the estimate of the state from the output of the sensor is, is something that we get to decide. Okay, and a really good choice is to say, well, our estimated state x hat is going to have the same dynamics as the state, namely it's going to evolve according to the same nonlinear function f, where of course wherever we had an x previously we put an x hat because we don't have x to use. But then we'll also have this additional correction term g that's a function of the measured output y and our predicted output. What do we think the measurement would be based on our estimation of the state. And we get to compare the estimated output or the predicted output with the actual output, and that's called the innovation. And what we, what we want to do is use the innovation or some function of the innovation in order to drive x hat to x. And when we do that dynamically, we call that dynamic output feedback. Okay? Now, Previously I mentioned static feedback. In static feedback, you just eliminate that differential term and you would cross this term out here and then you would just write down x hat as some, um, some uh, direct function of the innovation term. Okay, so static feedback is certainly viable and has many advantages over dynamic feedback. Okay, but this is your standard, uh, standard observer um, type system. And so this is what we mean mathematically and this is what we mean sort of in block diagram form when we talk about this dynamic uh, output feedback control. It's not exactly the standard observer. It's a Boolean observer because it's a equation, very simple, and it's actually accurate. There is a theory of the observer that it's very rare to come to this form. I mean, if that's what you want to do, fine, but it's not a standard observer. Yeah, that, that may be true. I, I put it in this particular form, which I agree is maybe not conventional, just to kind of emulate the uh, the resemblance to the state dynamics and state space form. John's only objection is to calling it the standard form. Yeah. And it's a sensible thing to do, and it's sure. commonly done. That's true. Everybody understands that. Sure. Well, so the actual observer that we. F is, F is, it's, not, it's not the fish, it's your, your, your robot. Well, I'm going to talk about what F is. This was sort of intended just as sort of a, a generic. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And in fact, the, 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 the complexity in our problem of F is actually minimal because of the way we constrain the robot. Um, the, the, the complexity actually lies more in the definition of the observer. Uh, and, and, and in particular, the type of observer that we employ is a nonlinear observer. And we employ a recursive uh, filter called a Bayesian filter. And for those of you not familiar, it derives directly from Bayes' theorem. Bayes' theorem is a powerful theorem from statistics and probability theory that can be understood by just examining the simple Venn diagram. And I'll come back to the connection to the observer in a moment. But if you, if you remember from probability theory that you can describe th these two sets, A and B, their intersection and their union using these notations. And indeed, the conditional probabilities of A conditioned on B and likewise B conditioned on A can be written by writing down two equations in terms of the intersection and union of these two sets and then eliminating the term involving the union. And so a simple algebraic manipulation arrives at this expression, which is Bayes' theorem. And if you like, we can assign names to these quantities. In particular, in a, in a filtering context, this quantity here um, is often referred to as the prior probability. And that's uh, indicated by this distribution right here, which is um, not required to be Gaussian. And this term here in the numerator is referred to as the likelihood function. Okay? And so it's the product of the likelihood function and the, posterior, and the prior distribution that results in the posterior. And what you can see is that the prior distribution has been shifted to the left due to the, due to the effect of this likelihood um, on the left-hand side. And the result here is the conditional probability of A and B. So in our context, what are these um, abstract um, quantities? Well, in particular, A is the state of the system, okay? And B being the measurement data. And X hat, this observer from the previous slide, is actually the mode of the, of the posterior distribution of A given B. That is to say, given all the measurement data that we've collected, what is the probability of each independent um, um, variable in the state space? 
And from there, what's the, what's the point in state space that has the highest probability, <coughs> okay? And that's, what we, that's how we define, um, in a non-standard way, the, the, um, the, the estimate of the state variable x. And the key idea in our case is that the integration uh, occurs over space and time. And I'll come back to this point. One of the hallmarks of a Bayesian filter, not only is, it, is that there is um, is that the measurement noise and indeed the process noise are allowed to be non-Gaussian, but in fact that this, 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 this product, which if you work in log space is actually addition, um, this product um, um, can allow you to integrate very weak signals um, in such a way to reinforce um, hypotheses um, provided that you're integrating over a, a long enough or a large enough period in time. So it's a very robust estimator and it's the, it's the observer that we choose largely because the physics that we're working with are indeed nonlinear and non-Gaussian. Okay, so the last uh, kind of tutorial slide here is in, in regards to how we optimize our system. And the optimization lies, uh, lies in, the, in the idea that the sensor output actually depends on how we design the sensor. So can we design the sensor to produce an output that actually will allow our estimator, our Bayesian filter, to perform better? And the way to quantify that performance is through a nonlinear control concept known as observability. So as you can see here, observability is a measure for how well the internal states of the system can be inferred by knowledge of its external outputs. Remember from our original chart, the sensor measures the state and, and the output that it produces is some function of the state. And the question is, if we're given the flexibility to do so, we can tune that function to pr improve performance of the observer, its ability to, met, to estimate the state. And so the way we quantify that is using a, a Gramian known as the empirical observability Gramian. And this quantity um, involves, um, involves these uh, perturbed outputs, y plus i and y uh, minus i, that correspond to the ith component of the state. And the perturbation, the output that you get when you perturb the state, the ith component of the state, about a nominal value. So you have some nominal value of the state and you perturb it in simulation and you look at the effect that that has on the output. And if you integrate this over a certain period of time and you do this for all pair, pairwise combinations of the state variables, you produce a matrix. A matrix. And this is the empirical observability Gramian. And the utility of the, of, the, of the Gramian lies in the fact that the singular values of the Gramian actually produce very good scalar metrics for performance of a particular sensor design. And in particular, if we look at the reciprocal of the smallest singular value, we have what we refer to as the unobservability index. And so it's a scalar metric, a score, if you will, that will allow us to compare different uh, sensor designs. And in the context of this project, we've used this a couple different ways, one of which is to optimize the placement of the sensors on the fish body. So let's talk a little bit now more specifically about the, about the robotic system that we built. So we start with our physics, and in this case it's the fluid uh, physics um, concerning the flow around a streamlined body. And to produce um, this model, we use a potential flow model whereby you can start with a circular disk. Again, this is a two-dimensional system. And by combining these flow primitives, a uniform flow, a doublet, and a vortex in a particular way, um, you can produce the flow field and the flow speed pattern um, across this cylinder, okay? Now using a technique from complex analysis known as a conformal mapping, you can reshape this uh, disk into very precise um, uh, geometries, including this streamlined airfoil that you see here on the right. And it's that geometry that we sought to emulate with our robot because of our ability to predict for very low angles of attack and flow speed the flow patterns that, um, that the sensors would be exposed to on the body of this, of this fish. That's right. That's right. And that's one of the reasons why our analysis really has been limited to low, very low flow speeds and very low angles of attack. And one of the benefits of our experimental studies is to show how well the theory allows us to extend um, beyond those theoretical limitations. 
So the question is, well, we have some flexibility with where we put the sensors on this streamlined body, and so how might we optimize this? And this is where we invoke the observability Gramian. And so the analysis of the small singular value, again, the reciprocal of which we refer to as the unobservability index, as a function of the placement of the sensors allows us to actually identify the optimal location for flow speed sensing and angle of attack sensing. Incidentally, these two quantities are the only two un known states in our, in our potential flow system. Um, we, 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 we presume that we do not know the speed of the flow incident upon this uh, uh, body or its angle of attack relative to that flow. And we want to optimize the sensor placement to estimate those using a, our dy dynamic uh, observer. Um, and in particular, what we have found, um, which, which the biologists tell us is a little bit unnatural, is that, in fact, for angle of attack sensing, a sensor right at the tip of the nose is, is ideal. And this is just, uh, this is not commonly found in biology because of the bilateral symmetry that you would have. Um, but we also found that to optimize uh, the measurements of flow speed, you actually want to put a sensor right at the point of maximum flow, which would be right on the shoulder of this streamlined body. And so that, that makes good intuitive sense. And indeed, these geometries yield a sensor arrays that, in our uh, slightly biased view, um, resemble the arrays that we observe on the fish. And I've rotated this figure of the giant Daniel with the superficial neural mass highlighted here, just to show that it resembles these optimal arrays um, in which the positions of these indiv individual sensors are optimized to measure flow speed at, at, at a range of angles of attack for which the potential flow model is valid. Um, and, and, and we like to think that these two pictures have some. What, the yeah, what do you mean exactly by, uh, by flow speed? The, well, it would be the, 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 the assumption is that, the, that the, uh, the system is immersed in a uniform flow. Now, as we see experimentally, the validity of that assumption is actually uh, put into question. But, but that's our model, is that we have a uniform flow. So in the, the flow speed would be the speed of the flow in the absence of the body. Well, the, the angle of attack is just the natural definition where we look at the symmetry axis of the body and its angle relative to that uniform flow direction. Yeah. I'm sorry, what? That's right. That's right. And, and there's a couple of different um, ways to respond to that, but I think the best way would just be if you could hold that thought for a moment because that's what we one of the powerful tools that we're employing in our result is the integration over a spatial array. And so, in fact, that's fortunately my next slide. Um, so, so this animation that the Levi produced is showing you, in fact, the power of the spatial integration that, that John is alluding to. Um, and, uh, and what you see here on the left are um, a series of measurements being collected with noise actually added here uh, over the sensor array on the uh, around that's been optimized um, over the, the the shoulders and nose of this uh, streamlined body. And on the right, you see the posterior of our Bayesian filter. Okay, the conditional probability of the state variables, namely free stream velocity and angle of attack condition upon all of these observations. And so in fact, what we see here is that spa the spatial integration is already quite good. The fact that we have multiple independent measurements of, this, of these unknown parameters, even though, and let me play it one more time, um, even though um, if I were to pause it, what you would see is that the individual likelihood functions are actually quite faint. So if we look at, say, that's the posterior after two measurements, you, we do see the sort of um, banana-shaped bulge here that, that highlights the ground truth. But we really have no um, reason to believe that any one of these points is more likely than any other. And so that's evidence of the sort of robustness of the Bayesian filter that by integrating and accumulating the evidence over a, over a collection of sensors, even without integrating over time, which we will do next, we're already getting a very uh, localized probability density. My two favorite audience members. <laughs> well, you said it. You, you came to a room where a lot of where you could draw people around. Well, you want to get some questions? No, it's not much. 
it, there's something you didn't explain, which I think you ought to explain. Right? Why is it that my control function only depends on estimates of this divider? Because that, that's kind of the way we've designed it. But, but why? Because you, you must have somewhere some reduced order model, something that says that I only care about this particular motion and these things and so on and so forth, therefore, that's good enough. Yeah, I think, that, I think this will become apparent once I show the design of our robotic system. But because we've constrained it. Up front because yeah. Here's why, right? Because you're touching the problems that for 40 years have been unsolved. And using approximations, right, that they're very questionable. And in the end, they work. So there must be something that simplifies the problem. I think, that makes it work yeah, I think the main simplification is that we restrict our robot to only having two degrees of freedom. Meaning? Rotation yeah. and translation cross stream. Okay. And in fact, the, we're also, not even working with the dynamics, but rather just the kinematics, the first order uh, differential equations. I had another uh, completely different question. You said that the optimal, there were two sensor locations that were optimal, but, but you're never going to use just two sensors. That's right. So the optimization problem you really were interested in was do I have, what, 10, 15, sure. 20 sensors? Yeah. And we studied that. That must be a different result. Right? Well, it, it's a complicated result to optimize. It's this combinatorial optimization that we've looked at. But our, our simple solution, which has worked quite well, is in fact to just, because we don't know the angle of attack that we're going to be um, ex encountering, we optimize for each angle of attack the number of which is equal to the number of sensors minus one because um, we have one on the tip of the nose. And then we say, well, we'll put a sensor at each optimal location corresponding to a particular angle of attack in the range of the validity of the potential flow model. Well, I, I, understand, okay, I understand the logic of that. And so for the velocity sensors, which are making measurements independent of one another, unlike the pressure sensors that we'll talk about in a minute that are using uh, pressure differences like the canal narrow mass, this seems to be a viable strategy. Slightly less important, but uh, when you perturb the sensor information, you know there are many, many possible perturbations. You know, do you, what do you use? This is like weak variation and strong variation, calculated variations. You, 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 you guess you get a slightly different answer. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand. Your your computed observability gradient. Oh, right. How do we perturb f yeah, to produce that? Over what yeah, class of we've looked at a couple different ways, and ideally what we'd like is to perturb it according to the uncertainty in our posterior. Yeah. Um, we've looked at that, but ultimately what, what we've done is something much simpler, which is just a, a uh, perturbation that's a fixed percentage of the nominal value. Constant? Yeah. Yeah. And that was the, the magnitude was the epsilon that showed up in that, in that uh, equation. Okay, so now what happens when we integrate over time um, is, is also um, combined in this chart with the result of the closed-loop system. And so recall the, the, the notation that we used for our closed-loop system is that our control on the right-hand side um, is now a function of our estimated states. In this case, there's only one state um, that's, um, that's in the control uh, closed-loop control loop, and that is the angle of attack. Okay, so x, in this case, represents the angle of attack. x hat is the estimated angle of attack. And what we're trying to do here, and what this closed-loop system does, if, if you're familiar with this uh, notation, is actually exponentially stabilize the origin for a state feedback system. And for a dynamic output feedback system, provided the estimation error, namely the difference between x hat and x, goes to zero, then you will re restore that exponential robustness. So, what you see here bouncing around is the posterior, and the key idea is that we're integrating these measurements over space and over time, because the posterior at one time step becomes the prior probability distribution in the next time step. You, so you can see that it focuses itself rather quickly, and then the closed loop control um, drives it um, to zero.
And so this is, this is the resembling the reataxis uh, behavior that we see in, in the fish. And one of the reasons why the potential flow model works so well in the closed loop system is that even though the estimates of angle of attack would be rather poor for large uh, angles, the fact is that it's a vanishing perturbation because we're driving the system to zero angle of attack. And so the, the error in the estimate uh, actually improves the closer we get to our control goal. Okay, so what about station holding? Well, our approach to station holding again involved a potential flow model. In this case, the vortices that are shed from an obstacle shown on the left here in, in the presence of a uniform flow, the vortices shed in a, an alternating pattern known as a Karman vortex street. And this pattern, we believe, should be um, perceived by the fish in such a way as the fish can estimate the relative position and size of the obstacle. So when we applied our observability methods to this problem, we were able to actually characterize sort of the field of view, if you will, of the sensory system to, to, these, uh, to, to these vortex inputs. So this color map indicates the, the degree to which we can actually estimate the relative position and circulation strength of a vortex um, um, with respect to the, the f a reference frame fixed to the fish. Okay, and we see that we have these blind spots um, uh, out in the corners where the, where the observability is very low. So this is a, the closed loop system. So it follows pretty much the same p design pattern as before. In this case, the Bayesian filter that we invoke is a particle filter, and so that w is what each of these little specks are, um, rather than a gridded filter, as was the case for the reataxis control. And the size of each of the little specks corresponds to its probability. And if you're familiar with particle filtering, you, you, you know that what we're really after here is sort of the mode of the distribution, which you might represent as the, the largest particle. Um, and what, what, what we're after here is a state space system in which the unknown parameters are the, are the cross stream distance of the, of the fish relative to the obstacle, um, as well as the circulation strength of these vortices that are being shed, um, as well as the size. So the gray disk, of course, represents our dynamic estimate of this quantity, of these, of these quantities, namely the, the size and relative position of the, of the obstacle. And what the fish is again executing is this very simple linear control law that drives the cross stream uh, relative position to zero, which again is the resembles the station holding behavior that we see in fish, whereby they translate into the wake of this uh, of this fixed obstacle. On the experimental side, we sought to replicate these um, using uh, this fish robot equipped with eight whisker sensors, each of which is an IPMC um, sensor that's, that produces a, an electrical signal proportional to the flow speed, the local flow speed um, incident upon the sensor. Okay, and so. The, a critical step in this process was how to convert, unfortunately this axis got cut off here, but how to convert these flow speeds and angle of attack inputs um, um, into, these, into a, a prediction for what the uh, electrical current that each sensor would produce. This is the calibration, that, the ever critical calibration of our sensor. And so what we, what we found effective is again a potential flow model um, that allowed us to fit data, very painstakingly collected data over all flow speeds that we expected to encounter and all angles of attack that we expected to counter. And for each sensor, we could actually fit um, this, this potential flow generated surface um, to minimize the calibration error. And one of the key things to note here is that we're actually using the standard deviation of the current rather than the mean value of the current as our measurement data. Okay, but by integrating over space and time, once again, we're able to use um, um, the, the measurement signal to estimate these two unknown quantities, uh, the angle of attack and the flow speed. Okay, 
So here's the closed loop system. After we perform the calibration routine, we can then stick the fish in the water and it performs the reataxis. So the flow here is progressing from bottom to top in our flow tank. And you see that, again, the, the fish is this extruded airfoil shape submerged in the water um, attached to this vertical axis with, that is actuated. Um, there's also a gantry system that allows motion in the cross stream direction. And that's what's uh, employed here to re replicate this station holding behavior. So the obstacle is a cylinder. You can see that the top of the cylinder is this black disc here, but it actually extends down into the water column. Couldn't you have uh, calibrated experimentally to simply stick the thing in the water and let the water flow by? And yeah, and that and that's exactly what we did initially, and that would allow us to produce a lookup table for the states, and that's what other people have done. But our, the approach that we ultimately um, selected was one based on the model of the flow physics, and so we were able to employ the potential flow model to produce the predicted measurements of the of the uh, of the sensors, provided that we um, resolve these these unknown calibration coefficients. Yeah. But one of the um, one of the, uh, I think, real contributions of the work is in this last part of the talk, um, which is where we eliminated the calibration routine altogether. And we did that by employing a combination of the pressure and velocity sensors. So as was mentioned earlier, in fact, Bernoulli's principle governs the relationship between flow velocity and pressure. And there's a number of pesky constants that are floating around. But by taking the difference, as fish do in the canal neuromass, between two pressure measurements at two different points, you can eliminate those constants other than the fluid density from, from your measurement equation. So the key idea in employing the pressure sensors um, as, a, as a secondary uh, sensing modality is that that the measurements, unlike velocity, are differences between pairs of sensors. Okay, and so we constructed a hybrid artificial lateral line system by employing these. These are actually um, uh, small pressure sensors um, um, used as catheters in animal surgery, uh, but they provide, proved to be very effective uh, for underwater robotics as well. And so you see the whisker sensors here. We install uh, the, the, the pressure sensors to measure the static pressure of the fish. We, we finish uh, installing the sensors, and then you get our hybrid, uh, our hybrid sensory system. So the goal here was to see whether we could use the pressure sensors to, uh, to bootstrap, as we call it, the velocity sensors to avoid this rather cumbersome calibration procedure. And the way that we achieve this is by conducting a very short um, motion routine uh, in which we move the fish so that the pressure differences between pairs of sensors in turn are zeroed out. Okay, so we turn the fish, for example, until the, the sensors two and three, or in this case two and four, um, produce a difference of zero. And by doing that between um, um, these three different pairs, um, two, four, one, three, and then two, three, or equivalently one, four, we can actually determine uh, the, the, the flow speed and the angle of attack of the fish at the moment that the pressure difference is zeroed out. You know where this is going? There's a field of mathematics called uh, you know, electrical impedance tomography. Say that again? There's a field of mathematics that's called electrical impedance tomography. Okay. That applies to almost any problem you can imagine where you have a space-time problem where you try to infer variables like you do by uh, doing experiments where you select specific sensors and then accordingly you move the sensor. Sure. And I suspect behind that, well, I appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'm surprised how well did not not use that because you know. Well, this is work that this is work that we did. But I'll ask Shabo and I'll tell him that he, you said he should remember that. Um, I will email him after the talk. Um, at any rate, and so this, this simple procedure that replaced our rather lengthy calibration procedure produces three points uh, for a given flow speed. And it's a little hard to see in this 3D plot, but we get 
we, we can monitor the measurements from the velocity system at three different angles of attack without actually providing the ground truth from some external sensor system that we produce the location of these points and verify the location using the pressure sensors and then we can in a sense uh, bootstrap the velocity yeah, sensor no, system. Did so you did this experiment in this couple of sensors which is, is I think very interesting I would say most likely we did. We we have done a little bit of flow visualization. Um, it should work, right? I mean, that, that, I mean the theory that I'm I'm studying the theory. What even when you have uh, vortices. Yeah, one of the advantages um, to where we put the sensors was that the flow was. Um, was still laminar on the front shoulders of the fish, of the foil. And we don't, didn't have any sensors uh, closer to the tail. But we certainly took that into consideration when we chose the conformal mapping parameters that produce the sort of shape and elongation so of the foil. Like, so what does it speak? We do this thing, right? Then you're going to yeah. create some places where the flow beyond the resume of the capital yeah. is Yeah. My claim is it right? You can go to, to higher relative flow between the fish and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the liquid, and still you're going to get pretty good control of that. Well, that's definitely the direction we're going, because we're, we're gaining interest in, in the propulsion aspects of these problems. But then, a very nice explanation would be that what you said in the beginning is your state. is not your state anymore, and as a matter of fact, it's not you. You go directly from sensors to controls without going to a state. I'll have to think about that. That's another game. Okay. Well, an obvious way to think about that would be, you know, all you're really trying to do is to match the pressure on either side of the fit. So, you know, you can just use a straightforward linear feedback of the pressure difference. Sure. And you'll try to know that. I mean, that's, that's for this very simple. Yeah, and, and, that, and, that's, and that's absolutely um, the approach that one can use if you have that nice symmetry. Um, in your pressure sensors on either side of the fish. But one of the advantages of the nonlinear observer is that if you have uh -huh. sensors pairs on the same side of the fish, like the actual anatomy of the fish, then you can, um, you can still perform this closed loop control um, without just using a simple differencing scheme. Well, for the real fish, it's much, much more complicated. Not so. Well, in the interest of time, since I have about 20 seconds, I'm just going to finish up here. A question to break up the dreams. Okay. Is there uh, any assumption that you make around the noise of the pressure sensors in order to do this? Yeah, there, there is. Yeah, and that's critical in the, um, the, the, the uh, measurement update step. When we compare the predicted measurement to the actual measurement, there is... Um, <coughs> we have to characterize the the uncertainty in the sensor measurement, um, and so it turns out that much in the way that in a common filter you can actually tune the process noise and the sensor variance um, um, to sort of make fast or slow observers, we actually use those as knobs that we tune in the close-up system as well. And that's what's being shown here is the closed-loop system of the hybrid fish whereby we've eliminated the calibration routine in place of the, of the uh, bootstrapping. It's tracking this uh, desired uh, step uh, signal here uh, depicted by the white dashed line. And it's tracking that by estimating the angle of attack using a combination of the pressure and velocity uh, sensor measurements um, and to produce the posterior um, and the mode of that posterior is the estimated angle of attack which is the pink line and we seek to drive that to the desired. Um, and so that's the result of the closed loop control. And in my last slide here, um, uh, although it says I have two left, so um, there's an ongoing uh, question about the complementarity of these two sensing submodalities. Why do fish have both? And why do we need both? Can't we get away with the pressure sensors alone or the velocity sensors alone? And so one of the ways we've um, tackled this question is by looking in detail at the likelihood functions. So again, these are the state space axes, flow speed and angle of attack. And the likelihood function, again, is the conditional probability of the state given the measurement data you've collected. 
and the contours of the light wave function generated by the velocity sensors are in green and the pressure differences in red. And although they both have the same mode as shown by the, the posterior, which is the heat map in the background, um, the ground truth being pink, um, the, the shapes of the contours, uh, and in particular the direction of the gradient of the contours of these light wave functions differ in places, namely out here and other places you see the, 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 the degree to which the information from these two sensing modalities complements one another as opposed to being redundant. And so the way that we've um, just very recently in the last couple of days thought about characterizing this complementarity is by looking at a measure of the distance in probability space between these two likelihood functions and doing that over the entire state space. So that's what's plotted here on the right. We use the, the um, KL divergence uh, uh, once symmetrized as a measure of distance between these probability densities. And we've plotted that over the state space. And so indeed, there is a large swath of the state space where this symmetrized distance is blue, meaning that the sensors are basically providing redundant information to the observer. But at large flow speeds and at small angles of attack, we see that in fact, there is an independent contribution of information from each modality as, as uh, illustrated by the distance between these probability dis uh, distributions. And so this is ongoing work, but we're, we're forming kind of a basis for understanding why both uh, sensors are needed. And indeed, the biologists are quite interested in this. And so this is an instance where our robotic experiments perhaps might shed some light on the biology itself. So I'm going to end there um, and, uh, and, and let you read the summary slide. Thank you for the spirited discussion throughout. I expect nothing less from this audience, but I'd be happy to take any other questions at this time. Thank you.